Love it. So um, I've been noticing a problem in here lately. This has nothing really to do with the sermon, but here's the problem. So, um, you know, we are averaging like 300 plus in here every Wednesday night. And I know numbers have been bigger in the past and smaller in the past and things like that. But the problem is, is that if we had every single one of you bring a friend one night to hear about Jesus, this room would not even be big enough. But isn't that a good problem? That's a good problem because, man, we get to just slam this room out front to back, wall to wall, side to side, and, um, and then we get to figure out where to go from there. Did, did y'all know, again, nothing, really not much to do with tonight, but did y'all know there are 50,000 teenagers within like a 15-mile radius of, of First Baptist Woodstock? 50,000 teenagers. We are known as one of the largest student ministries in America, and we have anywhere, probably about on a weekly average, about 1,000 or so. Which means, which means that we are, man, we're, we're just, we're barely even reaching a percentage of our area. Like, I seriously think, man, when we, when God just does something huge in our ministry, the worship, the W building, the big, like, big top Jesus building over there, right, is not going to hold us because of the plans that God could have in our ministry. Do y'all believe that? Y'all believe God could do that? Somebody say amen if you believe that, all right? So here we go. So... With all that, with all that, turn to Luke chapter 24. I'm glad that one person believed that and clapped. That was awesome. We're on the same page. That's good. So um, turn to Luke chapter 24 real quick. How many of y'all, you would consider yourselves an adventurous person? Raise your hand. An adventurous person. Okay, like you love adventure, death divine stunts and activities and all that kind of stuff. You love to travel to exotic places. Is that you? How many of y'all, you just love to travel? You just love to travel. Man, you like to take trips. You're like, I'm not adventurous. I'm boring, but I do like to go places. Yes. Okay, there you are, right? So, man, I love, I love like adventurous trips that I get to go on and experience new people and new places and new foods and new things. I remember one time I got to go to Belize. And Belize is just this incredible country. Probably it's one of the smallest countries I've ever been to, but one of the most awesome countries I've ever been to. First of all, um, the people in Belize are like extremely um, just genuine. Man, just authentic, real people. Like I've been to Jamaica before and basically I was just trying not to get murdered every night, you know? But in Belize, like people are actually nice to you. And, and man, it's, it's incredible. Um, I don't know what's going on right now, but that was awesome. Um, <laughs> So with Belize, so I got to go to Belize, and, and we got to do a couple things in Belize. We got to go into the, into the Mayan temples, which was really awesome. That We might even have a picture of the Mayan temple um, in Belize. I'm not sure. It might show up. We'll see. But so you, you basically like climb to the top of this Mayan temple and look out over all the land and everything, and, and uh, you can play tag in the temple and pretty much like have your own temple run human-sized game, right? And which was just awesome. So we got to do that in and, and, and the Mayan temples. We also got to go to the beach. In Belize, we got to go to the beach, and we got to go to the spot there at the beach, out in, out in the ocean, in the water, and it was this place called Shark Stingray Alley. And it was a wild park to where literally, and no fences, no cages, no you know, guides or anything, you would just be out there, and they would let you out, and Shark and Stingray would swim up to you where you could actually touch them in the wild. How many of y'all would do that? Raise your hand. You would do it. Yeah, it, was, it really was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. So here we were in Belize. And, and by the way, by the way, by, let me ask this question. How many of you, when you go on a family vacation, your family will always end up in one big argument over vacation? Raise your hand. Is my family the only one? Okay. So isn't that interesting? Like, we plan these big, expensive awesome trips for families to have fun and grow together, and then we're just like at each other's throats all trip long, right? And here's, here's what I find interesting about that. It's very interesting to me that that doesn't happen on mission trips. It happens on family vacations. And I think the reason is when we go on family vacation, we always go on va family vacation for me. We always go on it for me, like, man, what am I going to do? How am I going to have fun? How is this vacation going to serve me? But when we go on mission trips, I believe that it really, 
resonates more deeply in our core with the way that God has created us and designed us because God didn't create us for vacation. He created us to go on mission. God created us with a purpose. God created us with a cause. So here I am in Belize on this mission trip And I stand up one night with my team. My team is out in this church crowd, and we're in this Belizean church with all these people out in the seats. And I stand up honestly as like a cocky, arrogant American about to tell them how they need to live their lives in their city. And basically, I'm about to get up and tell them, listen, we have, we have spent all this money. We've raised all this money to come to you. We've put together this whole strategy to reach your city. We have gone through months and months and months and months and months of preparation. And now we've landed here and we're doing you a favor. And here's what we're doing all this week. And when we leave, here's how you need to continue on what we've started here in your Belizean city. And then it hits me. What I am preaching to them What I am about to ask them to do, my church back in Alabama at the time was not doing ourselves. To where, this is how the Holy Spirit started to speak to me. I was about to tell them how they were to live missionally in their city as our mission trip ended and left, but we weren't going back to Alabama to live missionally like we were living missionally there in Belize. And it hit me, we truly only see missions as a trip. So much so that the way we view missions is, let's go to another country and let's do a trip there. But at the same time, because we won't live that way here, that country, if it's Ireland or El Salvador or Belize or whatever it is, they would need to come here to Woodstock to do a mission trip to us because we aren't doing here what we were doing over there. Does that make sense? And so tonight, yes, we are rolling out mission trips, and we believe in mission trips. And as Woodstock students, we get fired up for mission trips. Amen? Make some noise if you love mission trips here at Woodstock students. So... I'm excited. I'm excited to tell y'all, man, where we're going. Like, this is a huge part of our ministry, but we cannot be a ministry who does mission trips without living missionally here. So what does missional living mean? Here's here's what missional living simply means. Let's go and throw that up on the screen. Missional living simply means living for Jesus, living for Jesus, simply means to live for Jesus in in such a way that every day people could get saved. Is that up here? To live missionally simply means to live for Jesus every day in such of a way that people could get saved. I want to show you that real quickly, what that looks like from this passage. So turn to Luke 24. If you're already there, say word, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, here we go. Luke 24 Luke 24, look at verse 44 with me. We looked at this a little bit last week, but look at verse 44. Luke 24, verse 44 says this. Then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything, Jesus says, everything written about me in the law of Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and the prophets, that, that's the major prophets and the minor prophets in the Old Testament, all the way to Malachi and the Psalms. Those are all the poetry books in the Bible um, from all the way from Job going up all the way to like Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. So all of this stuff written in the Bible must be fulfilled about me. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And like we talked about last week, what does that mean? That he opened up their minds to understand understand the scriptures. I think this is so huge that honestly we need to talk about it twice because I know that repetition is the key to memory. And so we need to make sure that we know what it means that our minds have been open to the scriptures. 
Have you ever heard today that, man, so many people are all about, man, you've got to be an open-minded person, right? You've got to be open-minded, right? And so, man, if you're an open-minded person, that means that basically you don't really believe anything. Like, you're open-minded to everything, right? And so yellow could be purple and purple could be green. And, and you know, you're so open-minded that, man, Buddhism is true and Islam is true and Christianity is true or none of it is true at all. you just got to be completely open-minded so that you respect and receive and even believe everybody else's positions. Well, guess what? God doesn't call us to be open-minded, but he does call us to have opened minds. Because Jesus says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And what did he say? When someone understands the Bible, look at it again. Verse, verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So when Jesus opens their minds to understand the Bible, and some of y'all are here tonight and we love you and we're so glad that you came. And you feel like that when you open the Bible, you can barely understand it. And we want you to know you are not alone. Some of you may be here tonight that you don't believe the Bible at all. And we want you to know that you, we are so glad that you came. We, we are so glad that you're here because, man, we just want to show you what God has done in our lives. And you are always welcome. And you are always invited in here. And we love you. And we just, we just want to talk about the Bible simply. Man, we, we don't want to get just unbelievably technically deep and, and to where it, you, you don't understand it, to where it doesn't apply to your life. Like, we really do want to see life change. And we believe what Jesus just said, that when Jesus, like when we pray and we ask God and God blesses us, when God, when Jesus opens up our minds to understand the scriptures, it's just simply understanding who Jesus is and what he's done all throughout the Bible. It's called the gospel, the good news. So as we're doing this whole series here called Centric, the reason we called it centric is because we believe that everything is centered on Jesus. Everything revolves around him. The reason we exist, the reason we are created, the reason that the universe is here, the reason that earth stands the way that it is, the reason that life is the way that it is, because God has actually created everything for Jesus, which, which is why when you try to make life about money, it doesn't work. When you try to make life about sports, it doesn't work. When you try to make life about you, it doesn't work. When you try to make life about another person, it doesn't work. Life fails and breaks down at every single point unless you make your life all about Jesus because that is who life is all about, amen? So that's why we're here. That's who we are. That's what we do. And so we saw the first, the first sermon, the first session that we did in Centric was all about the gospel, and the big tagline, the one-liner there is, is that our life is centered on Jesus. And we talked about that the gospel is that, that who Jesus is as his person, that Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. His work, what he's done in our life, that he is, he's died for our sin and he has risen from the dead and, and that we are called to turn to him in repentance and follow after him with our life. And that is so important to drive our missional living, to simply live every day in such of a way that people can get saved. To simply live in such of a way that people can get saved. I remember back at my last church, I had a, had a little eighth grade guy. His name was Michael. And this little eighth grade dude named Michael came to me and said, hey Chip, could you come over to my house on Friday night? Could you come to my house on Friday night? I said, sure, man, what's going on? He said, oh, I'm just having some friends over. I said, well, man, I'd love to. He, he, he said, I want you to come meet my friends. I said, man, I'd love to come meet your friends. He said, there's more to it. He said, Chip, now think about this, an eighth grader. Michael said, Chip, I'm inviting every one of my closest friends over to my house to spend the night this Friday night, and they're the ones who don't yet know Jesus. He said, I'm going to have eight friends over there, and I want you to come over, 
and I want you to hang out. And he said, and then I just want you to tell them all about who Jesus is because I want to bring them all over just for that purpose right there. Unbelievable. He was just simply living every day in such of a way so that people could get saved. Man, I love it. So, so we started with the gospel, and then we moved to relational in week two, relational. And by the way, I'm going to get to those note cards on your chair here during this session. So go ahead and pick them up and the pen, and, uh, and, and I want you to see what's going on here. So relational, this, this is the way we talked about relational is our love is centered on others. As our life is centered on Jesus, our love is centered on others. Now listen, the way we do missions best, the way that we live uh, the missional lifestyle best is not alone, individual, or personal. It's doing it together. It's doing it together. This is why we view small, small group, Sunday school groups here at First Baptist Woodstock so important. Because we want you to be a team who goes out together and, and, and teams together to reach your friends. That's why we try to put different people of different schools in the same spot so that you can go and reach your school for Jesus. Now, we have something coming up called Love Loud. We have Love Loud, I guess it's been for the last several years at Woodstock going on, and it's just the way that Woodstock, it's just the way that First Baptist Woodstock can reach out to our community and just simply serve our community to show them the love of Jesus in hope that we would have the opportunity to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ, how to be saved. And we want every single small group to come up with a project in some way to serve your school, in some way to serve your community, in some way to serve this area so that we can show them the love of Jesus so that prayerfully we win the right, we earn the right in order to share the gospel of Jesus with them. So here's what we want you to do. We don't want to just tell you, tell you how to do this or tell you what to do. You are the best missionaries to teenagers your age. You are the best missionaries to teenagers your age. Listen, I'm just the student pastor here, but you, y'all are the youth ministers. Y'all are the ones who go out every single day and do the ministry every day in the schools. Y'all are the ones who are around your friends every day. You are the ones who God, God is using you most in your friends' lives. God has called you to step into their lives. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take two minutes real quick right now, two minutes, and I want you to give us one to five ideas, whatever it is. And we're not going to be able to do them all, but we want the best ideas that you can come up with so that we can do missional projects to love our area and help them to earn the right to share Jesus with them. Can we do that? So here's what I want you to do. So it might be like, hey, we need to go to this certain school and we need to paint. We might need to go to this certain park and clean it up. We might need to go and, and go to this certain team and root them on and serve them a steak dinner after or whatever. Listen, th there is like absolutely no boxed in parameters to this. We want you to think outside the box so that we can love others and reach them for Jesus. You've got two minutes. I want you to go. Go now. You can talk with your friends right now. You know, just think up really cool ideas together. One to five ideas. How do we reach this city missionally for Jesus? Get it. You got two minutes. You got two minutes. All right, one minute, one minute, one minute. Once you got it written down, I just want you to fold it and put it under your chair and we'll grab it after. Just fold it and put it under your chair and we will grab it after. 30 seconds, 30 seconds, write it down. We want the ideas from y'all and then we're going to continue on. Ten seconds. 
All right, if you're done, go ahead and fold it up, put it under your chair, with your pen under your chair unless you need it, and then we'll grab it after now. Number three, everybody look at me, number three, wrapping up the series. I want y'all, this is like the series that, man, we're just going to operate off of from all the rest of our series. Is number three, real quick, we did gospel, we did relational, number three is disciple, real quick, disciple. Remember we talked about last week, the importance of having those three in your life, who you can be real with. You study the Bible, you talk about the gospel, and then you disciple each other by being honest and being real about life and pointing and challenging each other to Jesus, confessing sin to one another, and challenging each other to continue on following after him. I've got my three out of the student ministry. I meet with three guys every week, and we have a great time. I'll tell you more about that here in a second. Look back at Luke 24 with me. So, when we believe the gospel, everybody look at your friend and say gospel. When, and then when we live relational, look at the other person, the other side, you don't like as much because you didn't choose them first and say relational. Relational, that's right. Now look, look. When we believe the gospel and when we live relational, then, then, we, naturally, we're going to disciple. That's the way God's designed it. And when we believe the gospel and we live relational and we begin to disciple, then we live missional. We live these missional lives. Check this out, Luke 24. This is so cool. Luke 24, look at verse, um, look back at 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Here we go. And then he opened up their minds to understand this as well. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Just give me a few minutes to finish this out right here. Jesus said that we have this awesome opportunity, first of all, to proclaim repentance. I don't know about you, that feels like a very negative word to me. We hear preachers scream all the time, repent, repent, repent. But the word that Jesus used with repent was to proclaim it. To proclaim is a positive thing. It is good news. It is to shout an announcement that is beneficial for people. We are showing them that repentance is good. So here, here's the deal. If this wall right here is sin, and if we are living for sin, repentance means to turn a 180 degree direction. So if this wall is sin and this wall is Jesus, and when we're born, we are all walking towards sin, we have to move away from sin, turn from sin in order to turn to Jesus. We cannot turn to Jesus unless we turn away from sin in order to turn to him. Does that make sense? So we're encouraging people to repent. Now listen, that might sound like a weird word today, but everybody, everybody is looking for a change in their life. Everybody is trying to turn their life around. They're just trying it in every other way other than Jesus. Let me give you a very hardcore, extreme example of this because I, I want you to hear this extreme example because I know there's a lot of smaller examples. When I lived in Louisville, Kentucky one time, I parked my car in front of one of my neighbor's homes. It was like a, a public street that his house was on. So I parked my car in front of his house, going into my house. He comes running out of his house drunk, screaming at me, trying to pick a fight with me. I was like twice his size. I'm like, bro, I could obliterate you. Please calm down, right? And so he, he comes out screaming at me, cussing at me, all this kind of stuff. And he's like, you can't park your car here. I'm like, why can't I park my car? He said, it's my house. I said, I understand it's your house, but it's a public street. This is the only spot. He said, where am I going to park? I said, you're already home. What do you mean, where are you going to park? Like, you're already here. Where's your car, bro? And so, so we started just kind of yelling back and forth. And so then I got convicted, you know, I was studying to be a pastor. I'm like, I'm an awful neighbor. So I'm like, hey man, I'm really sorry. And I stuck my hand out. I said, my name's Chip. And he said, yeah, man, I'm sorry too. My name's John. And John looked at me and he said, hey man, I don't know if you noticed, but you see how like all the windows at the front of my house are all busted out? And I said, yeah, man, I've, I've, I've actually noticed that. And he said, when people found out that I was the homosexual living on this street, They've driven by three times and threw bricks at my home and busted out the windows here in the front of my house. So we started to talk about it. 
and he began to tell me about his life and, and what had transpired to where uh, it made him go down that road. An unbelievable, awful, awful story. To tell, I'll, I'll just tell you the story in short because you're high schoolers. Here's what happened. He got married, and his first wife just started cheating on him and sleeping around on him. So he left her. They got divorced. He got married again, and as he married this, this second lady, his first wife came back and said, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry, would you please take me back? And so he said, I can't, I'm married. And she said, no, you're the love of my life, I've got to have you back. And so he tells his second wife, I'm sorry, I've got to go back to her, she loves me, she was my first love. He goes back to his first wife and she says, I was just kidding, I never really wanted you, I'm done with you. And he said, from that point on, from that point on, he started going down the road of homosexuality. I actually, I, I had my Bible with me because I was in, in Bible classes during those days. And so, so I opened up my Bible and I said, bro, I, I just want to show you, man, I'm not, I'm not condemning you. I just want to show you what God says, like, like you know it's wrong. And, 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 and here's where God says that you can overcome this. And I'll never forget it. John looked at me square in my eyes. He looked at me and he said, Chip. Every single day since that day that I started down this road, I wish I wasn't gay. It may not look like it from the outside, but people are screaming for a change on the inside. People desperately desire repentance to turn from sin and turn to Jesus because that's what God has created us to do. Secondly, not only are we proclaiming repentance, we're also proclaiming forgiveness. Write that down. We're proclaiming forgiveness. And the reason we are proclaiming forgiveness is because people today don't feel forgiven. Like nobody forgives each other, one another. Nobody forgives other people. Like, man, people, when they hurt other people, man, people hold it against them or people hurt them in return or just push them or shove them aside and the friendship is over or, or they are strained relationships at home and with their parents or normally if they're close friends, when they ask for forgiveness, people say, don't worry about it, it's okay. When people ask for our forgiveness and all we tell them is it's okay, we're not offering them forgiveness. Really what we've told them is the sin you have committed against me is okay. And that's not right. When people ask for forgiveness, we should say, I forgive you. Because then we're saying, you have wronged me, but Jesus Christ died for that wrong. So because he died for that wrong, I'm able to forgive the wrong that you did to me. And when people lay their head on their pillow at night, Satan is constantly working in their minds with two main weapons, guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. Constantly they're feeling the way that they're living, that Satan has this stronghold on them, that they feel guilty for what they've done and they feel shameful for what they've become. And when People go to God and confess sin and apologize and say they're sorry in order to give their life to Jesus. God doesn't just say it's okay. God says, I forgive you. And everyone is longing and yearning for true, real, deep, genuine forgiveness. but it's so hard to understand because we rarely see it in our culture. And we are the people who gets to proclaim that it's real, that it's out there. And then the last thing we see in this passage real quick, it says to proclaim these things in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So I was studying this passage with my discipleship, my three this week. We were at Chick-fil-A hanging out this past yesterday at 4.30 to 6, just kind of looking at this and talking about it and talking about life and all this kind of stuff. And we didn't have any plans. Like, I didn't have it written out. Man, it was just open conversation. And I, I love this. I, just so you know, I love this. Like, here's what the Spirit of God led us to. I mean, like, God was really working in our conversation, and it was just awesome, just the roundtable talk that we were having. And here's what God led us to. 
that we want to live more missional lives. And the way we're going to do it this week over the next seven days is not to say every single person we're going to try to share the entire gospel with, right? And we're going to give them the whole plan of salvation. And we're going to make them stand there for 30 minutes so we can say it all, right? We're not going to do that. We're not going to do it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to obey this passage. And we're simply going to try to speak the name of Jesus to people who we don't know or that we know who are lost, who do not know Jesus yet, who have not given their lives to him yet. We are simply going to speak the name of Jesus and we're going to watch and see how the Holy Spirit opens up those conversations, open up that kind of talk to where maybe he would take it farther so that we can share the gospel. That is... Is sim- that is simple, missional living in such of a way that people can get saved. So he says to start from Jerusalem. Just like I was, I was convicted in Belize because I wasn't doing it, we were trying to go to the nations, but we weren't starting where we were. So here in a few minutes, as we roll out these mission trips for you, as we tell you where you're going to go this summer, It's not that we're going to prepare for these mission trips and go on the mission trips and then say, okay, guys, we went on these mission trips. How do we go back home and how do we do it? No, here's what we're going to do. The way that we prepare for the mission trips is we're going to do here what we believe we're called to do there. And we're going to start living missionally here and now. And I want to call each and every one of you. Like, let's create a problem in this room. So where right now is 450 chairs are set out. And look around, and it's a great crowd in here. Let's create a problem in this room to where we are busting out of this place because, because we believe in Jesus. And Jesus is the ultimate missionary. Jesus, the ultimate missionary, who stepped out of the comforts of his own home, heaven, and he came down the earth, and he stepped into the life of humanity. And Jesus stepped into our life and he became like us. And Jesus lived in such of a way that he did not just preach at us, but he loved on us. And he served us. And Jesus did not demand our sacrifice for him until he sacrificed himself for us. And Jesus did not demand that we be righteous, but first what he did is he died for our sins to make it possible for us to live for him in righteousness. And Jesus did not die and say, just live like me. Instead, Jesus rose from the dead so that we can continue to worship him and believe in him and follow him because he is real. He is the ultimate missionary, and he is simply calling us to be on mission, not just for him, but to be on mission with him. That's the point. So here's here's three things I want you to do. You can lock this in your memory. It's going to be a great way to memorize it, or you can write it down. We just want you to share with somebody, anybody, everybody. If you've never lived missionally before, where do you start? Just share Jesus with somebody. If you've done that before, how do you grow? How do you continue on? Then just go to anybody. Don't leave anyone out. It doesn't matter what they believe, what they look like, where they're from, what's going on, what they're doing. Man, we go to anybody, and then last, if if you've done that, if you're like, man, I'm doing that here, Pastor Chip, what do we do? Then we go to everybody. Man, we reach the nations for Jesus. We we, we do it, you know, where we are. We do it through social media, on the internet. Man, you start a blog, you go on mission trips, you, you talk to people of different countries in your school because you know that they are reaching out to other people and family and friends from different countries where they're from. And we do whatever it is possible to share Jesus around the globe because that is what Jesus has called us to do. As we are following him, we follow him as we do missions with him. Last thing. It's always very interesting to me how Christians say, how do I do it? Like, I I don't know how to share my faith. I don't know how to talk to somebody. How do you even start the conversation? This is the way that I think about it. This is the last thing I say. This is the way I think about it. Imagine yourself as a middle schooler. And as a middle schooler, your parents come to you and your parents say, hey, 
You can invite one friend to come on family beach vacation with you. One friend. You can go to the beach with us. And that one friend that you invite, we, we want you to go and tell them about the beach. Man, we want you to bring them with us, and, and we'll pay for them and all that kind of stuff. And you don't get all excited and get crazy and get pumped up and get fired up and then remember and say, Mom and Dad, how do I invite a friend to the beach? And they don't say, oh, that's easy. Let, let, let's give you a class on that for a semester. Okay, sit down. Here's a workbook. Okay, here are, here's a bunch of fill in the blanks on exactly how to invite your friend to the beach. And this is called Beach Evangelism Explosion, right? And so this, you know, and so here's how you do it. No, you don't, listen, it is good to go through evangelism classes, but you don't need to be trained. You don't need to be trained in order to tell your friend how, that they can go to the beach with you. You just go to them and say, listen, it's going to be hot, it's going to be sunny, there's going to be popcorn shrimp, there's going to be sand, there's going to be fun, and it's all expenses paid. Who wants to go, right? And you have friends paying you to see who gets to go. In the same way, if you're experiencing Jesus, if you can't wait for eternity, if you've truly been saved, if you love walking with him, you already know enough of the gospel because you've been saved by the gospel. You already know enough of the gospel and you have that emotion in order to share with anybody that your heavenly father has come to you and says, invite anyone you want to come with you to heaven for." eternity. I heard a pastor say this one time, and it still convicts me to this day. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. I just want you to think about this with me. If God answered all of your prayers this week, if God answered all of your prayers this week, how many people would be saved? If God took this week to say, whatever you pray, whatever you say, I'll say yes. How many people would be saved? If God blessed every conversation we had this week, and just worked his power in a mighty way. How many times have we tried to share the gospel in order for people to be saved? This is not a one and done sermon where we never mention missions again. This is the start of a movement in our ministry that this is the way that we gotta live. There are way too many lost people. There are way too many lost people in this area. Not to spread and to talk about and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are not just friends. People are not just family. People are not just acquaintances. People are not just strangers. People are human beings that have been given a soul that will spend forever in heaven or hell. They've been created in Jesus' image to reflect him, to know him, to love him, to grow deeper with him. And we're the ones given the awesome privilege to proclaim repentance is possible. Forgiveness is attainable. Jesus can be known. Would you pray for me? I do not feel like that my heart is wrecked enough to be on mission daily with Jesus. I, I need to feel this. I, I, I need this. We need this. We need this. 
I just want to give you an opportunity to pray right now, and you might want to grab a friend and come to the front or just put your arm around them and you all pray together. We'll just take a couple minutes to do that. Before we do, I just want to give you an opportunity just tonight, if you're somebody in here and, and you, man, you're thinking to yourself, gosh, I, I can't be on mission to reach others because I haven't given my life to Jesus yet. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right now? Would you just raise your hand right now? Because we would love to help you. We would love to help you. Just raise your hand right now just, just so we can pray for you, we can help you, and we can do anything that, it, that we need to do to help you out in that process. We are so glad that you're here. Man, we want you to know Jesus. We want you to know that you can be forgiven of, of your sin. We want you to know, have the confidence of where you're going for eternity, life, and, and forever with him. Man, we want you to know Jesus Christ. Anybody else raise your hand right now? Raise your hand, please. Please, anybody else? Make sure that I see you. Make sure that I see you. Anybody else right now? Man, here's the time. Man, God is just speaking to your heart right now, and now is the time, and you need to talk to somebody. Man, you need prayer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Raise your hand high, please, just to make sure that I see you. Raise your hand high. Man, you've had a hard week. Man, you would love for God to be in your life. If that's you tonight, man, Give us the opportunity to help you, please. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Raise your hand right now. Make sure that I see you. Anybody else? Raise your hand right now. Well, the band's just going to play this last song. They're going to play and they're going to sing. I want us to worship. And that may not mean just sing. That may mean that you pray this entire song. That may mean that you grab a friend and you say, listen, we've, we've got to do discipleship together and encourage each other to be on mission together. It might be that, that you need to get together with another friend to pray for another friend to say, listen, we, we've got to share Jesus with this person. Like, we've got to be burdened and passionate about mission because all that matters in life is eternity in knowing Jesus. So I'm going to shut up and I'm going to get off the stage and I'm going to let God work and let's pray, and let's worship, and let's just let the Spirit move in this place, and you just obey, and you do what God calls you to do, and after this last song, we'll talk about these mission trips. Y'all pray.